various forms of presenting sets and notations for sets. In this presentation, you will be able to present sets using an interval notation, an inequality, a number line, a roster, set builder notation, a vein diagram. Add to that is to be able to define notation used in sets. That is elements of a set, number of elements in a set, sample space or universal set, subset, empty set, intersection of sets, union of sets, complement of sets. These concepts are very, very important to know because they are also used in probability. Now, what are everyday examples of sets? Let us start at our kitchens at home. Kitchen organization. In our kitchens at home, what we normally do, we put things according to their use. So by putting them according to their use, we are putting things in terms of sets. Like here, these are pots. Here, these bottles, they are containing things we need to use at some point. But I'm simply saying, as we organize our kitchens at home, we use the concept of set because we don't put everything on one place, but we put them in terms of their use. By so doing, we are applying the concept of sets. Again, add to that school bags. This is an example of a school bag with portions one, two, three, and four. You can put different things in those portions there. But as you do that, that is you are using the concept of sets. Now, when it comes to the shopping malls, shopping malls are built in such a way that you find that certain things are placed together that are things that we have the same use they are put on one side check when it comes to the supermarket if you go into a supermarket you cannot um, expect to come across a car maybe for purposes of being sold in a supermarket so we are saying the shopping malls are built and arranged in the um, manner that they take into consideration the meaning of sets. Again, we can talk of um, the rule book. Say this rule book um, belongs to a school, right? So in the rule book, we will discover that we have disciplinary rules. That's a set. Then we can get another set of rules for leave, referring to the teachers, right? You can also get a set of hostel rules to those students who stay at the school. So all what we are saying is we have these different rules. They are put in terms of sets, in terms of their usefulness. Okay, but what are sets in mathematics? The term set is used in mathematics to mean a collection of objects. And these objects are called elements that possess a specific property. That is, we are saying a collection of these elements, they are together because they have a specific property, right? Not that the elements in a set do not repeat. That is, as you put a collection of objects together, you make sure that those objects do not repeat. Right, now let us look at the um, definition of a set using interval notation, inequality, and number line. Note that X is an element of the real number set. The real number set is the number line. You know the number line starts from negative infinity to positive infinity. So X is going to assume those values. Therefore, in this table, the first column represents interval notation, then the second inequality. Then you give a particular example on a number line, maybe to include what is the interval as it were. So we are saying now we start with the open interval, right? This the brackets indicate that they are open. 
So we start from anything greater than A and choose in between until we reach to something less than B. So we are saying end points are not included, right? That is because of this type of brackets. It shows that this is an open interval. Don't confuse this writing of an open interval with the XY plane, the Cartesian plane where they could represent the coordinates, right? So here is what I'm simply saying, not an ordered pair, but a range of values. Ordered pairs are considered when we are dealing with the XY plane. So now this open bracket type of an interval, if we are going to write it in an inequality form, we are simply saying the X, right? That is the real number X should be a number between um, A and B. That means X is greater than A, but X is less than B. That is in inequality form. So we can have all the numbers that fall between A and B. This is why we talk of a range of values. There are so many of them. That is the values of X between A and B. There are so many, they are infinity. So let us look at an open interval of a particular example. So now it's like I'm saying my A is one, my B is five. This is an open interval. Right, so I'm going to represent it on the number line, trying to show why my saying is open. When we put it on a number line, we put a circle on one to show that one is not part of the element of the set and five is not part of the element of the set because it's open. But anything greater than one and less than five is the elements of the set we are talking about as being open because we don't include one and five, right? We go to another type of a set in interval notation, which we call the closed set. So open and closed should actually know the difference. Now, when it is closed, we use um, these closed brackets to mean the end points are included. A and B are part of the elements of the set right, or the interval. So in terms of an in inequality form to write the same thing, we then say A is less or equal to X, but X is less or equal to B. That means the extremes are part and parcel of the values of X, that is important. So in an um, closed interval, we are saying now using the closed interval notation, one and five are now included, but here they are excluded. Doing the same on the number line, we then shed at one and shed at five to show that one and five are part of the elements of the set in question, right? Then we go to another type of a set which we call nanny ending, right? Nanny ending, that means you can start somewhere where we don't know where exactly, but this um, negative infinity simply means it represents a very, very small number, but it's not a number. So each time you write negative infinity or plus infinity, you can never include the closed bracket because it's not a number, but it represents a very, very small number or a very, very big number when it's plus infinity. So, but at B, we are including B. So we are starting from a very, very small number until we reach at B. B is our last end. So we are saying nanny ending, nanny ending because we don't know what is that negative infinity. That's small, small, small number. So just know that B is included and minus or negative infinity is always not included, right? So when we now write it as an inequality, we are saying the fact that on the negative part or the smallest value X can take, we don't know. So we are simply saying X is less or equal to B. Why equal to B? Because yeah, this side is closed, but this one is open. So it's simply less or equal to B. Then when we try to show in a given, um, particular interval, we are simply saying now 
five is inclusive, but minus infinity is not a number, it's a sign representing a very, very small number. So it's always open. To represent that on a number line, we simply shade it five because it's included. Then show an arrow to say we are decreasing and then put just the arrow to show that we are going as far smaller as we can, the smallest number, which we don't know. So this is represented on a number line like this. That is important. Therefore, with that, we are through with the issue of representing a set using um, the interval notation inequality and on a number line knowing as we do that when it comes to the interval notation, we can talk of an open set, closed set, non-ending set. Now, the next task is we want to represent uh, a set using a roster, but what is a roster? A roster is a list of elements in a set separated by semicolon and surrounded by curly brackets, right? That is a roster for you. So that is an example. We have these sets S, A, and B. These are the carry bracket, the opening one and the closing one. Then the elements three and is separated by semicolon three, five, seven, eight, and so on up to 30, right? The A is written with those elements, the B with those elements. All the three sets are presented using rosters. So when we represent sets using rosters, we make sure we make use of the um, carry brackets and the elements are separated by a semicolon. Now, showing some of the notations for sets using sets S, A, and B above, we are going to use these sets as we try now to go for the notations of sets, that is notations used in sets. Right, let us start with the notation and element of a set. We use this sign, right? So that is an example, 13 is an element of S. So 13 is an element of set S. And if you go into this set, 13 is there. That means 13 is a member of this set, right? Then you go on to number of elements in a set. Say that set we are giving reference to set B that we have. We are simply saying to say number of elements in set B, we write N, open, then write the B and close. This is um, what you need to understand that we are saying how many elements are in set B. So we say number of elements in set B. So as an example, number of elements in set S, we go to S, we count them. If you count them, they are 11. So number of elements in set S is equals to 11 elements, right? We need also to know that the 11 that we got is the cardinal number of set S. This is important to know because in probability, we are going to use the cardinality of sets in trying to show some other important concepts there. So cardinal number of a set simply means we want to know the number of elements in a given set. In this case, it's 11. So 11 is the cardinal number of set S. Let's go on to number three, subset. This is the sign we use to indicate subset. So that as you see, we are saying, a set contained in another set. When you say a set is a subset of another set, we are saying that set is contained in another set, okay? So as a good example, if you look at the elements that are in A, 8, 10, 14, 16, 20, and 30, they are all in S, right? So that means A is contained in S and in diagram, simply put that circle, then A is the inside. Meaning A cannot have a number of elements more than S if it is contained in S. They can coincide if we had written the same elements that are in S and we write again in what in A, then they can have the same number of elements, right? So 
in writing that A is contained in S, we simply write A and you write the sign and the S and this red A is a subset of S. That means A is contained in S. Therefore, with that understanding, we can then say the number of elements in set A can be greater or equal to zero, but is always less or equal to the number of elements in S since set A is contained in set S. So there's no way the number of elements in set A can be greater than those in set S. Otherwise, at most, they can be the same, right? It's other instant, it is always less because it's contained in set S. So this is an important um, situation, right? And another thing we are going to realize that now, if we talk of an empty set, the sign to represent an empty set, uh, they carry brackets, they will be written two of them and inside there's nothing because the roster uses those carry brackets. So when they are written without writing any element, then we are saying the set is an empty set or to represent an empty set is like a, a zero or a circle that is canceled, but this is a phi. Its name is phi, that is P-H-I, phi. So when you see that a set is set is equal to this phi, that means that set is empty, or a set is equal to these two carry brackets, that means the set is an empty set, right? But we need to understand that an empty set is a subset of any set. Remember, we have talked about subset A being a subset of S. But we are saying if you have an empty set, it is a subset of any set. So that if I define another set C and um, say set C is equal to an empty set, then that set C is a subset of B, is a subset of A, is a subset of S by virtue of being an empty set. Therefore, that being the case, then number of elements in A can be zero. That means if A was an empty set, then the number of elements in set A can be zero. This is why when you reflect back to the um, inequality that we wrote to say uh, number of elements in set A is less or equal to zero, but less or equal to the number of elements in set S, it is because when it's zero, that means set A is an empty set. And again, when it is an empty set, it will be a subset of set S or another set. Let's go on to um, the union of sets. The sign is this one, or instead of putting this sign, we can put the word or, right? When you talk of units of set, we are saying elements in either set or both, right? Will be like, if you talk of the union of uh, sets A and B, we want all the elements in A and those in B together, right? So we are saying, we, as we do that, if we pick any element, it could be in A or it could be in B or it could be in both A and B. This is why we are saying elements in either set or both, right? So if I am now to represent the issue of A union B, they said that we have shaded everything to say that is the meaning of union B. This element, if you take any element here, it's only in the A, right? If you take any element here, it's in A and B. If you take an element here, it's only in B. So we are saying everything. So elements in either set, that means it could be here or here or here. That's the both, right? So all together, we are saying that is the union. So as an example, I'm going to write a set of A union B, taking into consideration that my A is represented by this, B is represented by this. 
then if we are now to group together, all what you have to remember is elements of a set do not repeat. As you can see, in A we have 10, in B we have 10, but when we put the elements together, we cannot write 10 twice, we simply write 10 once. That is the idea that elements of a set do not repeat, right? So all these elements are found in both A and B in terms of we have put them together. So by writing A union B is the same as A or B, right? Okay, if we now try to check on how many elements we have in A union B, that means if you count this from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they are 10. Number of elements in A union B is equals to 10. They are 10 elements. Okay. Let us go to the intersection of sets represented by this sign or you can use the word the end, right? So elements in both sets, right? When you talk of the elements of the intersection, those elements are common in both sets. That is what it means. So in a diagram, we are saying this is set A, set B, the shaded part represent the intersection of these two sets A and B, so that this element is both in A and in B. So if we are to look at the sets that we have A and B, A intersection B, we look at the element that is seen in A and is seen in B, and we only have that element is one and it's 10. 10 is here and again is here. So we can safely say A intersection B is equal to a set with only one element and that element is 10. And we can write this as equal to A and B. Now let us make some observations. The observations are coming from the fact that when we talk of the intersection, what can happen? What about if we don't have an intersection, what happens again? So as observation number one, which is A, if number of elements in A intersection B is equal to zero. That means if you are saying there is nothing there, right? That means we are saying A intersection B is an empty set. That means there is nothing common. Then we can safely conclude as number one, sets A and B are disjoint sets. So the word that you have to make sure that you understand is the word disjoint. Two sets are disjoint if their intersection is empty. And I can safely now write the two sets. This is A, this is B. There's nothing in common about these two sets. Hence, they are disjoint sets, right? Number two, we are saying if, we are saying the intersection is empty, there's nothing. Then we are saying if we want to find the number of elements in the union of those two sets that are disjoint. What do we need to do? We only add the elements in set A plus the elements in set B. That gives you the number of elements in the union. That is when you bring them together, you get um, that being the number of adding their individual number of elements, right? Observation number B, that is if the intersection of A and B is not empty, that is number of elements on the intersection is not equal to zero. That means this is the situation. Here we have elements, right? So if this happens, then we can safely conclude that number of elements in the union of these two sets, right? Is equals to number of elements in A plus number of elements in B minus number of elements in the intersection, right? Let me just try to show you why is it like that, that when we add the number of elements in A and those in B, 
then we have to subtract number of elements of the intersection. Here is the situation. I have taken the right hand side, that is the one I want to show. Right, we are saying number of elements in A plus number of elements in B minus number of elements on the intersection. So the thing is, here is my A. I've included the number of elements on the intersection, the green part, right? Then for B, I've done the same thing again. I've included number of elements on the intersection, meaning I've added number on the intersection twice. So to avoid this, I have to subtract one of the um, intersection. This is why we end up saying minus number of elements on the intersection, because we added here, it is added. Here, it is also added. So let us remove that second addition, right? Then if we are taking this for to represent number of elements in the A, then we are removing that to number of elements in B so that it don't repeat, we end up with this portion. So that if we add these two now, we end up with the correct number of elements in the union of set. So understand the reason why we are removing the number of elements on the intersection. It is because we would have added it twice. That is in A, I include on the intersection. In B, I do the same. So we are saying, the idea that elements in a set are not supposed to be repeated. So there's no way we can add, when we add B to take again the, what, the intersection. So we should then remove this part so that we end up with only the intersection being included in A, but not in B. So if we are now to try to demonstrate uh, what I have tried to explain here, we are saying in our case, this set, it has six elements, two, four, six. That is number of elements in um, A is six. Number of elements in B is what? Is five. But the number of elements, the intersection is one because of this 10, right? It's common. So that is the only element on the intersection is one. So now to apply this, we are simply saying, let us add them. We have already seen before that the number of elements in the union of set that we did um, earlier on, they were 10. So we are saying six plus five minus one, it gives us 10 elements. If you don't subtract one, you end up with 11 elements. That means you have added elements of the intersection twice. This is important. Okay, let's go on to complement of sets. It is written A prime, or we can say not A. And we read elements not in set A. That means this, as it is written, means elements not in set A. Or when I say not A, I'm simply saying elements not in set A. So in a diagram, this is our S, our A, our B, isn't it? So if we are saying we want a set representing those elements that are not in A, the set in white are the what? The A elements, not in A, everything in the green is not in A. So this is the set A prime. Elements that are not in A, everything shaded in green is not in A. If again, you want now to check using the example that we have here, uh, elements that are not in A, you check in the universal set, those elements that are not in A. And you find that three, five, seven, 11, 13 are not in A. So this is A complement. That means elements that are not in A. And you can simply say not A the understanding should be the same. So having uh, finished the idea of representing using the roster and we went on to look at the um, set notations, let us look at set builder notation, right? Set builder notation is a mathematical shorthand 
for describing the elements of a set that possess a specific property, right? The idea of it being a shorthand means that we write it using certain symbols, but to mean whatever it would have been said, but it is simply a mathematical shorthand. And it will be describing elements of a set that have a specific property, right? So as examples, let us look at example A, the set which is written as a roster, we have numbers one, two, up to seven. This is a roster because the elements are separated by a semicolon, and it's a roster, and they are finite. That means we can actually count and see how many elements we have. So if you want to write this set in set builder notation, we are simply saying, number one, we say a set of all x such that those two points means such that the x we are saying to form the elements of the set, x is a counting number less than eight. You know, counting numbers, we count, we call them natural numbers, isn't it? And those natural numbers are all numbers. So according to this set, we are simply saying the set of all x is where x is a counting uh, number less than eight. Or I can, I've written this in a set builder notation, right? As a roster, or we can simply write that it is a set of all x's. The forward slash also means such that x is an element of the integer set. Integer set that means negative and positive all numbers. But the fact that we have said x is an element of the integer set, but here we don't have negative numbers. We then say it is an integer, and that x. Being an integer, it should be a number between one and seven inclusive, right? So in, um, in a way that I've been explaining, I'm simply saying this, the set of all X, that means this X, the forward slash is such that the X is an integer number between one and seven inclusive. So this is this part, but as it is written, it is in set builder notation, right? Then another example, number B, we are given the set. This is a, a set which is in the interval notation, open on one side, closed on the other. So in set builder notation, I would write a set of all X such that X is less or equal to 10. So do you see now the importance of knowing how to write sets in terms of an inequality interval notation? Because here it is given in interval notation. Now when you write it in set builder notation, you are going to make use of the inequality form of representing this same um, set. So that is set builder notation. And the set of real numbers greater than 13 or less than 10 in set builder notation. Here you need to understand that it is written in words, right? Greater than 13 or less than 10. So we are going to write that in set builder notation. We are saying a set of all X such that X is less than 10, right? Less than 10 or the or thing, right? X is greater than 18, this part, right? So what is written in words, I've written it is a set builder notation. And the or, already I've told you that the or represent the union. So the or part now I'm saying, what you have written like this, you could have written it in this way to say, it is a set of all X such that X is an element of this set, which is a combination of an open interval, right? Now the union, another open interval. Whereas as you can see, um, X is greater than 13, but we don't know greater up to where. So it will reach up to plus infinity. So it will start with anything greater than 13 and keeps on increasing up to 
infinity. So now we are saying X should be those elements that we are going to take very small to anything less than 10, added to that anything greater than 13 to anything very big, right? So this is one and the same thing, and that is set builder notation for you. And as you can see, when you write in set builder notation, there's no way you can be able to count how many elements you have in some cases. Because in this case, when you talk of integers from one to seven, then if I take one, that is X can be one. What is the next integer two, the next three, four, five, then this is very clear, you come up with a roster. But when it comes to this situation, there's no way you can have um, definite number of elements. They are infinity because X is said simply to be less or equal to 10. So we start at 10, then anything less that is up to the smallest. So we have a lot of elements here. So the same can be said here, there are so many, you can't count them. Now, I'm going to give you an example where in we are trying to put together what we have been discussing, but in terms of um, looking at the X being an element of the real number set, that is the number line. But the starting point is I have a set being written as an inequality. That is X is said to be less or equal to zero or X is between three and 10, right? So if we are to write this same thing, this same set in interval notation, we are simply saying X, right? Remember the equal to zero, that means zero is included. So I close there. But the fact that is simply less than zero, then that is up to minus infinity. But I open up because minus infinity is not a number, is a sign to represent a very, very small number, right? Then the O means union. I'm taking the elements of X, then add to that the other elements of X that are between now three and 10. And that means this is an open interval because X is greater than three, but it's less than 10. That means it cannot take the value three, but anything greater than three, but anything less than 10, right? Then the same, if I am to represent this um, inequality in a number line, I'm simply saying X is starting from zero up to minus infinity. Then it, the um, zero is inclusive, right? This is why this is shaded. But the year 83, X is greater than three. So you simply say, well, you don't shed it because three is not a part. Then, when you do the same to 10, that means X is a value between three and 10, but cannot take three and 10. So this is the uh, representation on a number line of this set as it is written in inequality form, right? Then when it comes to set builder notation, we are saying it is a set of all X's such that the X should be an element of this set which is open on one side and closed on the other, and add to that union the open set, anything greater than four to anything less than 10. So when you take these elements, that is the X we are talking about, that is the set that will be formed. So that is in set builder notation, this as it is given, it is written like this. You need to understand this. Then when it comes to a roster, you know a roster, it has elements that are separated by semicolon. That means they are finite, they are discrete, they are exact, you can even count how many they are. But in this situation that you are given, we can't tell number of elements in such a set defined as an inequality. Therefore, the given intervals or range are not possible to write as a roster since X is an element of a real number. And when you simply say now X is less or equal to zero, where are we going to stop? We know we can start at zero, but going to a very small number. So how many are these? So there's no way we can write 
this inequality as a rost. Okay, is our last um, concept to look at is how do we now present sets in a Venn diagram. But first, what is a Venn diagram? A Venn diagram is a drawing in which circular areas represent groups of items sharing common properties. As long as we talk about sets, there's no way you can put things that don't have something in common. So here we are talking of um, circular areas representing groups of items sharing common properties. So a complete Venn diagram begins with a rectangle representing the sum of space normally um, put as S. That is all things we are interested in. Then each subset is represented by a circle. Now, from the sets that you have been working with, the S, that is the sum of space, the A is a subset of S, the B is a subset of S, which means A and B are contained in S. So that said, we can now present this information in a vein diagram that is set S, A, and B. So this is the vein diagram. The rectangle, we say that a rectangle representing the sum of space. So that means this rectangle, whatever is inside, is representing the sum of space S. Then we draw our A and B. But if you look at A and B, we have something in common. That means there's an intersection. So they have to cut each other like you have seen. So the first thing to do, you place the elements of the intersection. So you put the 10, then you then go to A. A is the circle in black. So whatever is inside the circle in black is in A. So then you make sure that everything is represented. And how many elements do you have? There are uh, two, four, six. So if you count, we have two, four, six. They are all in A. Once you have done that, then you go to B, do the same. B is the red circle. Whatever is inside the red circle, right, belongs to B. And then you see how many elements in B, there are five. So once you have presented everything, you count two, four, five. So as presented, this is um, a vein diagram where it has a rectangle and uh, the subsets, that is A and B, are represented by circles. But these circles are inside the what? The rectangle. So after you've represented the sets A and B, you then check the um, sum of space to check whether are they, all the elements represented. You simply, whatever is in A and B is part of what? Of sum of space S. Right? So as you can see, when you look at all that comparing with A and B, we realize that three is not in A nor in B. So three will be outside the two sets so that now our sum of space is completely represented. If you count the elements, both outside A and B and those in A and B, they should give you the number of elements in set S. So set S have got 11. So if we count, we have one, um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So set S is now represented. So it's now a complete Venn diagram. All the elements in S are there. All the elements in A are there. All the elements in B are there. This is important. So all the same, we have seen the various ways of representing uh, sets and the set notations. So all what it means is you should know these various ways of representing sets, the set notations, you should know them because in probability, they are going to be so much used. <laughs>